Since 1954, the Arlington Committee of 100 has offered local residents a reliable, nonpartisan platform based on public dialogue. Its reason of being is to really help make our citizenry more informed so they can be more eager and, and effective partners in, in governing ourselves. It's democracy. The nice thing about the Committee of 100 is it's when you've got time to slow down just a bit uh, in the Arlington uh, cycle of, of, of news and life to stop and, and talk about what's going on. The organization's foundation is grounded in monthly meetings where residents, area politicians, and civic associates dine and debate critical issues and potential public policy. We'll have a pro and a con on the issue. Try to get all of it aired out. If they're present, that's a good thing for them to hear. They're hearing uh, people who are knowledgeable about the issues discuss those issues and it's a good source of input for them. I've just been proud to be part of the Committee of 100 for this time because I think we have been the one place where you could consistently rely on getting good information from honest and earnest people who would come and tell us about how things were. Since the 1950s, committee chairs who serve one-year terms have challenged membership to tackle high-profile issues affecting Arlington's community and culture, a vital voice influencing public opinion, educating the masses, and playing a key role in driving some local legislation. We did the uh, topic of human trafficking in Northern Virginia, which is, I think, was a real eye-opener for folks who didn't realize that we are one of the largest areas for human trafficking in the country. We talked about legalizing marijuana and it was quite an interesting discussion because we had pros and we had cons and we had people in the middle and we had people who had benefited from clinical marijuana and others who really didn't think this was something that was right for Virginia. And we had a program on the new hot lanes that were being proposed and then are now I suppose are built and that was quite a controversy if you recall the county entered a lawsuit against the state. It was on the question of whether Arlington should have uh, a baseball stadium because apparently the Montreal team was moving. The county, back in the late 60s, early 70s, saw that Metro was going to be a fact of life. And instead of trying to uh, not have it, they embraced it and they saw the the great uh, opportunity for development. One of the plans we had was to try to get uh, greater uh, minority involvement uh, because we all recognize that we had only a few uh, African Americans. Well the one about which I remember the most had to do with secondhand smoke. Now in 1988 you were free to smoke anywhere you wanted. You could smoke in restaurants, you could smoke in schools, you could smoke anywhere. For much of the 2000s Arlington's dealt with issues related to affordable housing and that was certainly a big uh, topic during our year. As I recall uh, we had a program on an innovative approach to solving the affordable housing cr uh, crisis, uh, having accessory dwellings uh, built on Arlington properties, uh, using um, sheds, using garages. We addressed issues of housing for young people in Arlington. We addressed the BRAC closure and the impact of the loss of the military in Arlington. We also looked at high school dropout rates. So for me, it was really uh, valuable to look back at what we had planned as a year and see that my goal of making sure we represented the diverse issues in Arlington really came to be in the year. So in the mid-90s, there were so many changes happening within Arlington from a demographic standpoint. The, there was uh, an influx of younger people in Arlington County. Uh, the community was certainly becoming more diverse from, in a variety of ways, uh, from languages and ethnicity and races and whatnot. People cooperated mm -hmm. and there was a, certainly a very civil, civil uh, discourse and, and considerations. It was an effective forum without partisan rancor, without uh, conflicts, certainly opposite op opposing opinions were presented but it was done in a very collegial environment. As polarizing partisan politics routinely stifle debate across the river, the Arlington Committee of 100 has civilly and progressively addressed hundreds of critical community issues, a proud tradition that's maintained by active membership and unique leaders. I had friends who were part of the committee who said, you've got to be a part of it, you've got to join, we want you, we need you. You hear topics that are of major interest to our community and also to our region. I said, what, what better deal is that? 
So I immediately signed up and, and uh, have been a member of the committee since then. We were the, the first that were co-chairs, and I think so far the only ones that have been <laughs> co-chairs. Um, Anyway, so, and then we've been on the board and stuff, and now I'm treasurer, so it's, we continue to be fairly involved. It's interesting. Um, I think we all often got involved because our predecessors had something to do with it. I think, frankly, that's probably one reason I was selected as chair. Uh, I was among the younger members of the committee at the time, if not the youngest member of the committee at the time. I like the concept of bringing people together. I like bringing people all different ideas, all different backgrounds together. And I think that's the way you work effectively in a community. And I think that's been the success. Each generation, it's their task then and their great opportunity to build that up and to build this democracy. We're still in the process now of building that. And the Committee of 100 is one of the real building blocks of democracy. For future Arlingtonians who want to get civically involved, if you're frustrated by the inability of Congress, for example, to get anything done or to talk about things in any kind of a productive way, right here in our own backyard, we've got a vehicle where people can get together and discuss important issues and then take that activism and take it into their neighborhoods, take it into their communities, really take it you know, into their, into their homes and, and make positive change. The Committee of 100 gives us so many perspectives on an issue, things that you're not going to find in the paper things you're not going to find in Twitter, things you're not going to find if you talk to one political party or the other. And it gives you that wholesomeness that I think we need to make good decisions and keep Arlington moving forward. Terry McAuliffe is the 72nd governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Since being sworn into office, the governor has worked tirelessly to grow and diversify Virginia's economy and encourage more businesses across the nation and globe to locate in the Commonwealth. And I use that word tirelessly, emphatically, because if you know him, you know exactly what I'm talking about. As a testament to how hard he's working, just today, the governor announced that Shandong Tranlin Paper Company, a leading Chinese pulp and paper company, will invest $2 billion over the next five years in Chesterfield County. This investment represents the largest Chinese investment in job creation project in Virginia history and is the largest Chinese greenfield economic development project in the United States. It will create 2,000 new jobs by 2020. In just over five months on the job, the governor's administration has made significant progress in building a stronger transportation infrastructure, taken steps to reform Virginia's education system, and has restored voting rights in more Virginians than any other governor during this same period of time. <laughs> now, as you probably all know, these are very trying times in Virginia politics and have never been more interesting than they are right now. And the governor should be commended for working in a bipartisan way to help grow Virginia's economy, expand access to health care, and increase, increase educational opportunities for students. Please give me a warm Arlington Committee of 100 welcome to His Excellency, to the Commonwealth of Virginia, Terry McAuliffe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be with you, buddy. Good to see you. Great. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. All right, all right, thank you. Let's hear it for Patrick Hope. Let's great my greatest introduction ever. Well, let me say, folks, I wanted to drop by and congratulate you on uh, the 60th birthday for the Committee of 100. I hear that you have been having monthly meetings, bringing folks from all political persuasions together to talk in a civil, common sense way. <laughs> Any chance you come down to the House of Delegates for a couple of days with me? <laughs> but honestly, your vibrant discussions and bringing folks together, that's what it's all about. Uh, I thank Patrick for that great introduction, but really congratulations on all that you have done. Uh, as Patrick has mentioned, I have been very hard at work. I ran for governor. I ran a platform of growing, diversifying the economy, opportunities for everyone. And I want you to know after about five months in office that I have done exactly what I promised you I would do. Within 
A half an hour of being sworn in as the 72nd governor, I signed executive order number one, which there will be no discrimination in the state workforce based on sexual discrimination. It will not be tolerated. <laughs> because in order to grow this economy, we got to make sure that we are open and welcoming to everyone. And I also, as you probably read in the newspaper two weeks ago, I was very unhappy uh, with some recent Board of Health decisions that were made about women's health centers. I promised women that I would be a brick wall to protect their rights, and I trust women to make their own decisions about their own personal health choices. So two weeks ago, I asked in order that the Board of Health go back and look at every one of those regulations they put on the books and change them back so that they're common sense for women. <clears throat> so we've dealt with the social issues. We put them aside to make sure that we're open and welcoming. Um, a lot of exciting things have happened. As Patrick mentioned, uh, I've had a great 24 hours. I was just up in Annapolis, and uh, I signed the Chesapeake Bay Agreement. For the first time, we got all the governors together to sign the Chesapeake Bay Agreement. And Virginia, who refused to even take part the last four years, we took the lead to make sure that toxics, toxins were included in this year's agreement. And guess what? We added the word climate change to the Chesapeake Bay Agreement. <laughs> <clears throat> and the sky didn't fall in. Uh, I have reconvened the Climate Commission, which has not met in four years. We are now going to meet and make recommendations, because I am very concerned. Uh, in Hampton Roads, you cannot be in Hampton Roads on a day when it rains. I was there the other day for several events. I happened to have the mayor traveling with me, and it rained for about 45 minutes. About a third of the roads that we attempted to go on in Norfolk we couldn't go on because the rainwater had gotten so high. This is a serious issue. Uh, Norfolk, Hampton Roads is sinking and the sea level is rising. So we have a responsibility to start working on that today. So on the environmental issues, we are bringing everybody back into the fold, common sense, working in a bipartisan way. I was just a couple weeks ago at Natural Bridge. As you know, Natural Bridge is one of our wonders that we have in Virginia. Uh, this was originally owned by the Monica Indians, and then it was owned by the King of England, and then owned by Thomas Jefferson. And then a businessman from Virginia, uh, and then who moved to Washington, actually purchased it. He had the right to sell it for a nice profit. He did something very nice the other day. Uh, he actually turned it over to the Commonwealth of Virginia, and we're going to make a state park out of that now at Natural Bridge. <laughs> Our tourism business is humming. Uh, I just toured Ware Wacomico. I don't know if you have known this, but Ware Wacomico is where Chief Powhatan, Pocahontas, and Captain John Smith, the only time the three of them were together, as Disney movies go, it is where <laughs> Pocahontas pled for the life of Captain John Smith. But we have just discovered the actual site. It's 12 miles from Jamestown. It is truly a spectacular. After everybody came over in 1607, they went over here to Ware Wacomico, and they have just discovered all the dwellings, and they have just found Chief Powhatan's actual dwelling, and they can tell because they got a map from Spain that listed what, where this had all occurred, 600 paces from the river, and they did, they paced it off, and then they found all these pieces of copper, which were then used as currency, that came over in the first ships in 1607. So uh, we got great stuff going in Virginia, and to get more tourists here, as you probably saw, I just announced that Air China, Four direct flights now a week from Beijing, China. I met the first flight last uh, Thursday. It was out of Dulles Airport, a gigantic 777. Four flights a week from Beijing to Dulles Airport. The, f the Chinese are coming over loaded with money to spend here in Virginia, and they're going to go home with no money. Um, but today's announcement was a big deal. $2 billion investment, 2,000 new jobs. We've been working on this around the clock. Yesterday, the deal was on, off, at least four different times. We were negotiating round the clock, but we got it done. And as Patrick mentioned, this is the largest uh, green field in the United States of America being done. It's the largest direct investment by China uh, here in the United States of America to do this, and it's right here in Virginia. I'm also proud to announce that China also, several weeks ago, after seven years, lifted the poultry ban. We now can sell our poultry back to China. This was so onerous on us that not only the poultry that was grown and done here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, but if there was poultry raised on a farm in North Carolina, it wasn't even allowed to come across our border to go out of our port. This was a huge hardship uh, on our agriculture folks. So 
all of us working hard. The Chinese ambassador just called me and informed me that uh, they lifted the ban. So I was in Norfolk yesterday. I loaded the first cargo ship with boxes of chicken feet that are he now headed over to China. And if you go on the news and Google it, you'll see me holding up this little chicken uh, foot. But, um, huh? Yeah, go feet, go. I'll do whatever it takes. But, folks, we're making great progress on business. Um, since I've been governor, I'm proud to announce that there are now 74,000 more Virginians working than the day I became governor, which is a record for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Now, it all sounds great, and we're making progress, but we do have a lot of headwinds. I think everybody in this room knows it. Anyone who does business with the federal government, I deal with these challenges every day. In fact, I spent an hour over at the White House this afternoon. We are the number one recipient of DOD dollars, number one in the country, Virginia. That's great when they're spending, but when they're cutting like they're doing today, it has a dramatic impact on our economy. Every day I deal with this issue. I've been working hard with our congressional delegation to save the George Washington aircraft carrier. They want to deactivate it. Now, when you deactivate an aircraft carrier, it's not just the aircraft carrier. It's two destroyers, it's two cruisers, and it's a fixed-wing squadron that accompanies it. It's 30,000 jobs. That's why it affects the entire Commonwealth. Now, we've got it back in the House and the Senate, billion-dollar cuts to the commissaries. They just announced 6% cuts to our, our National Guard. Folks, that's fine. We can deal with it. But we can only deal with it if we're diversifying and growing our economy. And that's what I talk about every day. That's why I ran for governor. I put a bipartisan cabinet together, Democrats and Republicans. It didn't matter to me your party persuasion. I wanted the best of the best. And we have got a great team working very hard. We made great strides in education. Uh, in fact, right in front of me is voted the number one superintendent in our school sitting right here. Let's have a round of applause for our superintendent. Come on, stand up. Don't we love Arlington? Okay. Uh, but we've made a lot of progress. I promised all of you I'd do something about the SOLs. Our children, let's be very clear, our children were taking too many tests. Our children were taking tests, and then they're taking pre-tests to get ready for tests. Our children are becoming experts on taking multiple-choice bubble tests. That does not create a 21st century economy. That does not get a children th child thinking cognitively. We want to see the critical reasonings going on. So we've eliminated five tests in the grade through middle school, but more important, we now have uh, our innovation task force to look at these tests. How do we find out creatively if they're actually learning? So we're making progress on the SOLs. I attended a meeting yesterday with a bunch of delegates and senators. We need to make sure that every child in the Commonwealth of Virginia has access to a pre-K education, early education. So Patrick and I are working on that. We've got to get every child. Bob Brink, I talked to you the other day about it. Every child should be dependent on your parents' zip code or their financial condition. If you're going to build that 21st century economy, we've got to teach those STEM courses earlier. I want every child when they go into kindergarten to get a Crayola book that says STEM on the cover. We've got to get them excited earlier because we have a problem today. Today in Northern Virginia, there are 40,000 IT jobs that are not filled. 40,000. Those businesses will not wait forever to fill those jobs. Either we fill them or some other state will fill them. Over the next five years, 235,000 new jobs will be created in Virginia. 450,000 folks, nobody here of course, is going to retire. <laughs> that is three quarters of a million jobs in the next five years. That is our challenge, fixing workforce development, tying skill sets to the jobs that exist today. I don't want our children getting out with a diploma and a lot of debt without skills. Let's tie the skills to the jobs, and that's what is the responsibility. Ann Holt, my Secretary of Education, working very hard on that. Transportation, as you probably have all seen, I've moved at warp speed. I got a great uh, Secretary of Transportation, Aubrey Lane, a great Secretary of Rail, Jennifer Mitchell, who we're all working on, I know, on various projects, but fixing our transportation. I've lived in Northern Virginia for over 21 years. I get it. You're stuck in traffic. You can't move your goods around. To go see your kids play a ball game in the afternoon takes three or four hours. Unacceptable. We have to unlock this region. We need to do it with rail, buses. Let's get people out of cars. Let's get them into ma as much mass transit. And I'm hoping by the end of the month, we'll all be riding the Silver Line, folks, which will be great for everybody. <clears throat> 
But I just want you to know, I, I spoke to the CTB, uh, the Commonwealth Transportation Board, first time a governor's ever gone before the board to lay out my agenda. We're going to spend our money on roads. First, we're going to ease congestion. Number two, I want to see if there's an economic development component. We've got to work with the local communities to make sure we're spending that money wisely. There are no longer going to be political roads. I don't care whose district these roads are in. If it doesn't make sense, we're not doing it. I stopped construction on Route 460. Everybody in this room should be outraged over that. We spent $300 million on a road with not a shovel being put in the ground. Now let me tell you, when you build a new road and you go over 400 acres of wetlands, guess what? You need a permit to do that. <laughs> but in order to get a permit, you have to apply. You have to fill out an environmental impact statement. None of that was done, folks. And we've already spent $300 million, and I don't know what I can get back. So I just want you to know that those days are over. Opening up between Richmond and Washington area to do what we can do on high, higher speed rail and high speed rail to get these cars off the road and what we need to do. We just need to move to the 21st century on a lot of our transportation projects. The last issue I do want to discuss, it's been in the news a lot. I have been very passionate about this issue, as have so many Virginians. I went through a week that I probably would find hard to describe. A longtime friend of mine, someone who stood at my side to say, we've got to close the coverage gap, and if we don't do it, Governor, I'm going to lose three hospitals. 20,000 of my residents will get coverage. Abruptly re resigned from the Senate, taking control away and our ability to do a lot of the things that we had to do. But listen, we have to deal with it. Let me just make this simple on closing the coverage gap, folks. We're talking about providing health care for 400,000 Virginians. We have already paid for it. Wherever you may be on the health care bill, it's the law of the land. As of today, we have forfeited in Virginia $838 million. It is gone. We can never get back. Can you imagine $838 million running through our economy, creating 30,000 new jobs, health care for 400,000 Virginians, 12,300 veterans would get health care, $202 million a year for behavior health issues on mental health. We are forfeiting all of that. And people ask you, why are you so passionate about the topic? Go with me to one of these hospitals and clinics. When these people look me in the eye with tears running down their face saying, Governor, I will be dead if you don't get this done. This is serious business for our Commonwealth. And I want to thank the delegates and the folks and senators who are here with me in this battle. This is not partisan politics. This is about people's lives. And I need your help. Make your calls. Call folks. We got to get this done. The most conservative governor in America, Michael Pence from Indiana, the other day took it. 27 states have taken it. Every one of our neighbors, Maryland, West Virginia, Kentucky, Arkansas, all these states I compete against have taken this money back. Our tax dollars are now going to other places. It is fiscally irresponsible. I come from a business background. You've all heard my story. I started my first business when I was 14. My folks couldn't afford to send me to college. So I either got to work or I wasn't going to school. Got fortunate, ended up being our nation's youngest bank chairman at the age of 30. Started dozens of companies. I have been an entrepreneur my whole life. You get in that arena, you take risks, sometimes you fail. But you get back up the next day, and you get back at it. Folks are counting on us to get back up and fight for them. So this battle, I want you to know, is far from over. So I thank you for what you have done here in Arlington and for the Commonwealth of Virginia. The idea that you can come together to discuss issues without people just absolutely going off the deep end on issues and coming up with a simple compromise. I always say that when I leave a negotiating table, I want everybody feeling good. Because if one side thinks they won too much, that deal will come back to you. You have done that. And I want you to know that I plan to be back here 60 years from today to celebrate your 120th anniversary. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be with you.
Thank you, Governor McAuliffe. Thank you so much. I think you can agree that he's one of the hardest working per people in Richmond. So uh, with that, let me turn the program back over to our chair, Kim Klinger. All righty, everyone. So dinner will be served momentarily. Let's give the governor one more round of applause, please. I don't know about you all, but my background in health care and cancer care is what brought me into the community. So we really do need to fight for those without health care, and I really do appreciate what folks like Adam Eben and Patrick Hope and the governor are doing for Virginia. One more round of applause, please. Thank you.